<laughs> There's only one slide. You had your lucky day. Right. There's some mysterious guy there who's uh, fulfilling all my wishes. Right. Um, I've been asked to um, concentrate on the residential market, of course. Uh, so I'll try to leave out as much as possible of the non-residential property market. Um, so, the first important thing we must all learn about property, uh, even if you are 50 years into the property business already, is that the, the, um, the cycle is very, very long. You will see there, <coughs> um, we haven't got data going, sit, like some, we haven't got data going back to 1960, but you can take it from me, the bottom was 1960. Then we had a bottom there, 1977. Then a bottom there in 95, of course. And this one is still looking for the bottom. You can see that's our forecast. We've got two scenarios there. Um, the blue scenario is the optimistic one. <coughs> and the pessimistic one we call the IMF scenario, not because it's a, um, uh, a scenario by the IMF, but because it's a scenario that, in terms of which we'll probably call in, they have to call in the, uh, <coughs> the, the IMF uh, economists, and they will, of course, um, have some, uh <coughs> some uh, conditions on which they'll give us financial help. Um, yeah, so it's very important to take note of this, especially if you are a developer. Um, there are times when it's easy to make money. Even I could have made money during those up years, not especially that one. And uh, those two, the 60s were halcyon years in South Africa. Those of you who were born much later, uh, the average growth rate in South Africa was about 6% per annum GDP. Um, and similar to the situation we had in the early uh, 2000s, uh, none of South Africa is making. The 60s uh, boom was the result of uh, all these uh, baby, uh, World War II baby boomers. Uh, who, uh, in the 60s, they became uh, students at universities and they were earning, they were much better qualified than their parents and they were entering the life and they started buying fridges and women and, sorry, you don't buy women, uh, whatever, you know. <laughs> So it was one, it was a historical uh, worldwide boom, well, in most of the developed countries in any event. And the 2000s boom that South Africa had was, of course, a result of the commodity price boom, over which South Africa neither had any, any, but any um, control. Um, and because South Africa is a commodities exporter, you can imagine that when commodity prices boom, then South Africa goes all very hunky-dory. Um, so these are the factors from outside that has an effect on South Africa's economy, which is a very open economy. We, we are very open to the rest of the world, uh, what's happening. We are up, utterly uh, dependent on what happens in the, uh, in the rest of the world, especially when it comes to things like commodity prices, because we are a commodity, price, uh, commodity exporter. Okay. <coughs> We're looking here at uh, real house prices and the real flat rentals since 1992. Uh, now, the house prices we got from various sources, but uh, mostly uh, they are uh, from these offices, so you can't argue with them very much. That is the, the blue line, house prices, and the black line is flat rentals. Now, flat rentals is mostly our own surveys, which we've been doing since... Um, yeah, since the beginning of Ruda, in fact, before Ruda, uh, which was, Ruda was established in 1987, end of 87. Um, so that's mostly Ruda's uh, surveys that we do, and we ask with the rental for standard units, and I think in this case, uh, two, bed, uh, two bedroom uh, standard units. Uh, and now we deflate it using, um, using the CPI, Consumer Price Index, then you get a rather flat, in fact, not flat, it's actually declining uh, in a long, term, a long term declining. And the question is, why is it declining in the long term? It's a scary thing if that is true. Um, I've got a theory that um, uh, 
the stock of flats that we've been uh, tracking since 1992, that it's a pretty old stock. You may recall that up to the late 70s, South Africa actually had rent control, which fortunately we got rid of in the 80s. Um, and uh, as a result, very little new supply was built in those years. And since then, very few has been built too. What we've been doing in South Africa, we've been uh, building all these uh, group housing. Um, and uh, so instead of building flats, high-rise flats, we've been building um, what we call in Afrikaans, mientaise. What on earth do you call it in English? Townhouses. Yes, thank you. Um, so that might be a reason that, in other words, the implication of my hypothesis is that um, these real house rentals, flat rentals that we're looking at, actually represent an aging stock, um, and uh, which explains why it's not keeping up with uh, house prices. I mean, the implication of what we're looking at there is, if that is true, well, certainly it is true of the old stock, even though we call it standard uh, quality, is that uh, when you had that bulge, that bulge there in prices, that of course was the 2000, uh, early 2000s bulge um, because of the uh, commodity price boom. Um, interesting thing is that the rentals actually in real terms kept on declining. So that opened up that gap there. And, that, and the practical implication is that your initial yields had been dropping. Uh, if you were a buy and uh, let uh, investor. I must tell you that, um, so I think this graph paints a picture which is maybe a little bit unreasonable, um, maybe a little bit unrealistic, as I explained why. Um, because in the long run, this is pure logic, in the long run, prices uh, will keep up with building costs, in other words, replacement costs, right? That's why we tend to, at Roda in our publications, we tend to de use as a deflator, we use the BR building cost index rather than the CPI most of the time. Uh, the reason then, of course, is that when you use the BR building cost index, which includes the profit margin of contractors, uh, then you actually represent uh, rentals over time as seen from a viewpoint of a uh, developer or contractor. Um, in other words, how profitable is it now, all other things being equal, to develop? Uh, because you now look at rentals in real terms, and the real terms um, implies, in our case then, that you've used the BR building cost index rather than the CPI. Now, in the very long run, the CPI and the BR building cost, they follow the same route, more or less, right? But in the shorter term, there could be huge deviations. Um, maybe just one back, oh, sorry. You will notice, I forgot to mention it, but when you look at the very last year, or two um, in that slide, that both of those lines are actually dipping slightly in the real terms, right? So I think that is very um, representative of what's happening in our economy at the moment and what's happening to the household finances. In the end, of course, I needn't tell you that uh, <laughs> Households can't pay more than they can afford, whether it's rental or whether it's uh, installment on a mortgage bond. So if the affordability is declining as it is right now as we speak, then of course, and I'm sorry guys, I'm just the, uh, the messenger boy. <clears throat> Alright, just to show you uh, this is, uh, I think you will find very interesting. What is the sort of real returns in the long run that you can expect from, from property? Now, in this case, um, I'm only looking at non-residential property, your typical uh, institutional type property uh, portfolios. Uh, and you can see the, f uh, the first Column is 1962 to 1977. You might as well have said 1960 to 1977 because 1960 was the bottom of the of the cycle. 
you might recall that was a sharp hole at the bottom. Um, <coughs> And then and that's a 16-year cycle, maybe it was 18 years actually. And then the 77 to 96 cycle was 20 years. And then the 96 to this present day is uh, already 27 years, but it uh, isn't close to its uh, bottom as yet. So this 27-year cycle that in which we are now is going to be more than 30 years. I can guarantee that to you. So uh, because South Africa is in a very special circumstance, right? Uh, anyway, the important thing is I would like to draw your attention to the bottom line there, uh, real total return. Total return, need I uh, um, remind you that total return is income return, income yield, plus capital appreciation, plus capital return, right? The two combined. So that's what the only <coughs> metric you should actually look at. Well, not the only, but that's the most important one you should look at. And the rule of thumb over the years has been, and this is an international rule of thumb, that from property you can expect a total real return in the long run of about 4%, maybe 5%, 4 or 5%, which is not bad because it's real, right? So inflation is, say, 6%, and you get a 4% real return, you get a 10% nominal total return, right? So it's not bad at all. Of course, it's not as, uh, uh, as good as what you would get from equity, equity investments, but in equity's case, of course, your risk is higher. So, oh yes, another thing I must tell you about that table that you were looking at is that uh, it assumes that the properties are not geared, right? Um, so it's typically how your financial institutions used to have them, the old mutuals and the, and the liberties and the, uh, uh, and the sunlums used to have them. Uh, <coughs> so it's a th sobering thought, guys. Uh, a last... A last um, Remark on the last column. You can see there at the moment, given the fact that the cycle hasn't been completed, the tentative total return, real total return, is 8,2%. Um, that, of course, is also evidence that, in fact, this cycle hasn't been completed. Uh, in other words, we're going into a longish period of very low growth. Um, in order, so in, in three, four, five years, that 8,2 will be something like 5% or so. I, uh, I'm, I'm quite certain about that. Uh, so it's just another um, way for me of proving or more evidence on the table that in fact we are, we are now in a down, still in a down cycle uh, f for property in general. And um, <coughs> yeah, and that also applies to this, uh, to, uh, to house prices. Uh, yeah. I thought I'm going to try and look, uh, make uh, flat rentals look good because I'm comparing them flat rentals over time now since 1992. I'm comparing uh, nominal flat rentals with Joburg office rentals. Uh, Joburg office rentals are in this case uh, the sentence of this world, not the CBD. And you can see depending on, oh yes, and this is uh, an index with 2000 equals 100. So we can say from that graph that you're looking at, that uh, flat rentals from 2000 onwards have been outperforming um, uh, office rentals in, in, in Johannesburg, uh, decentralized, especially since 2016. Uh, of course, if you look at South Africa's uh, ec economic performance over the past decade or so, it's, it's clear that around about 2014, 2015, we started going downhill. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, GDP per capita, uh, GDP per capita has been declining ever since. So South Africa is in that way becoming poorer, but not necessarily the guys who are sitting around the tables here because they are of course uh, in a different category. <coughs> At least I hope this is the case with you. But in the real terms, Okay, the year we looked in nominal terms, right, comparing office rentals with uh, flat rentals, uh, it's really comparing the best with the worst sort of thing. Um, but that will make the guys who invest in residential feel good. Um, now we're looking at the same graph, but in real terms this time around. And you can see 
uh, we've got a very similar situation here, but most importantly is that in the long run, since 1992, it's been, the, the, both these uh, time series have been on a downward slope. Um, <clears throat> now, yeah, I'm not sure how to interpret this, um, except that that's what you would expect when you say to yourself, um, that the current down cycle, which is already very, 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 very long, uh, must still run another few years before it reaches the bottom of the cycle. So this is maybe what this graph is showing us. <coughs> I thought you would find flat vacancies interesting. Uh, at Rueda, we've been uh, monitoring flat vacancies for a while, but unfortunately this graph only starts in 2017. It's a quarterly graph. And you will notice, just as you would have expected, that uh, yes, there was a gradual uh, incline in flat vacancies uh, starting in uh, 2017, but very gradual. And um, then you had the spike during the pandemic, of course, and then the gradual improvement thereafter. But checking the last three quarters, you will notice that it seems that there's a slight upward trend again, but very slight. It's too early to come to any hard conclusions about it, but it is certainly not impossible that it's a new trend that is starting. Why? Because the consumer out there is under terrible, but terrible uh, uh, duress. So I would like to reiterate this, that when the consumer is under duress, it's not just um, it, it affects both the, the rental business and the buy business of property, right, of houses now. Um, when interest rates are high, it affects the, buy, uh, the buyers more than the, than the renters, uh, as you could Im imagine. But even high interest rates also affects those who are, uh, who are renting. Why? Because their household income is only so much, and if they can't afford more, well, then they can't afford more, and eventually the landlords will get the message and they will st stop uh, uh, expecting a 5% increase per year or whatever. <coughs> right. Um, <coughs> we are in the lucky situation that MSCI uh, has been doing uh, total return surveys for residential funds since, uh, this, since 2017. And because it's now 2022, it means we've got six years data as per MSCI. Uh, just a word on how MSCI get their data. Um, these funds are valued by normal property valuers, not by uh, an, uh, JSE but by normal property valuers. So there is subjectivity there, of course, especially when it comes to things like capitalization rate, because there isn't a lot of evidence when it comes to capitalization rates of residential uh, uh, blocks. <coughs> uh, or, yeah. So uh, <coughs> what you're seeing here is that the total returns at the bottom of the slide in yellow, uh, yeah, 2017 was still, and 20, 2018 was still very good years, and then it gradually, and then, <laughs> quickly became uh, bad years, uh, well below uh, the interest rate. In 2022, it was above the, not the interest rate, above the inflation rate. Uh, <coughs> what I find strange as a valuer is that uh, the income return in 2020 and 2021, for the years ended 2020 and 2021, that the cap rates actually, the income yields actually declined. Uh, over those years, in spite of increasing. And uh, I ascribe it to valuers who are too friendly with their, with their clients. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And that seems to be the end of my presentation. Sir, 
Don't you got to be back on. <laughs> okay. I mean, that wasn't a very enthusiastic uh, round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Was it something that Evan said? <laughs> I'm just a messenger. So, so one other thing, we can, we can field a few questions now because we've got time to do that. Now, um, Evan, I think one of the things that, you know, a lot of people sit over here, they're all in different property businesses, and everybody says, well, my figures don't match with Evan's. Um, you're talking about the ind industry averages as it is, as it's reported. So our goal, obviously, as individual real estate operators is obviously to beat the averages. And, and maybe I'd just like to encourage, you know, people out there, I mean, if somebody wants to take the microphone and say, well, how can we beat those averages? <laughs> Are we going to accept those averages going forward? I think, I mean, I look at Jeff over here, Jeff's idol, <laughs> and he's saying, well, no, geez, my numbers don't look like that. <laughs> I'm going to beat those averages. I'm not going to accept it. So maybe just some comments uh, on that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing that you've uh, raised this. Um, the way we, we survey uh, vacancies, flat vacancies, is we have a panel of, uh, of estate, uh, real estate managers who have a portfolio of flats that they manage. Mm. You know, the guys like, for instance, the Trafalgars of this world. So every quarter we ask them the same questions. We ask them, A, how many doors, how many units do you manage is in your portfolio? And then the second question is, and how many of these are vacant? That's how we get it, right? Now, if institution is claiming they've got only a 2% vacancy, whereas the Reuters survey shows maybe a, what, I can't remember what my latest one was. Let's quickly check back. No, it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question. Why is there a difference? Is it because these residential funds are uh, more... Here we are. It's about 7% now, and nationally. These are national figures, right? Um, but it's for, this most, for the cities in South Africa, including secondary cities like maybe Port Elizabeth and East London and Sarchi. Sorry, guys. I, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the question then is, are these list well, there's one listed fund here today, uh, and they're going to be on our panel in a moment. Um, maybe they've got some wonderful uh, um, business plan that they would like to share with us. Why are they doing better than the, than the <laughs> average out there? Any comments? Any, thought, any feedback? Any questions? Not all together now. I mean, I know it's just the first day of the conference, guys. We're just getting into that. <laughs> of course, you could always improve your vacancy by dropping your rentals, you know, if, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> Any thoughts? Great. Well, Evan, you, you're back on a little bit later now for the panel discussion. Yeah. So, obviously, so thank you. I think put your hands together for, for Evan Ruder again. Um, <laughs> So we've got time, and I think that could be quite a robust discussion when we actually get into to that one. So thanks very much for that, Evan. Okay, so moving on, we're still do talking about things uh, economic and. Uh,